In a ruptured post-war world, a bitter rivalry developed between East and West. Ideological differences evolved into the global power struggle of the Cold War, influencing politics, economies, cultures and technology. In its wake, old rivalries linger and the powers of East and West continue to compete. Where once the space race was a defining aspect of this competition, innovation continues to be at its heart. Now, artificial intelligence, cyber security, telecommunications and biotechnology are new arenas in the 21st century race for power and influence. Many nations emerged with difficulty from the fault lines of the Cold War. Serbia is one of them, wrought from the former Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia, itself torn apart by war. A period marked by conflict and political upheaval culminated in the Balkan Wars and NATO's intervention over Kosovo in 1999. Now, after two decades of reintegration into the international community, has the Eastern European nation thrown off its pariah status in the eyes of the West? Over the next half hour, we explore Serbia's advancements in science and technology, a key part of its strategic plan to build bridges across a divided world. The Serbian Minister of Science, Technological Development and Innovation, Jelena Begovic, talks to Al Jazeera. Jelena Begovic, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. It's my pleasure. Um, to read some of the headlines with your name in them, it looks a bit like a sort of golden age for Serbian science and innovation. I'm talking about things like the growth of IC ICT systems, research and development centers and institutes, advances in biotech and artificial intelligence, particularly in healthcare, and of course, a, a burgeoning startup sector. Good times, is it, for Serbian science and tech? Yes, I think it's the second best moment. You know, they say 20 years ago was a perfect moment, but the second best is today. And I think uh, we are catching up with what is happening on the global level and Serbia is really becoming very vibrant when it comes to science and the development uh, of the innovations and uh, the government has recognized the importance of the science in facing uh, let's say challenges uh, that are ahead of us and that are tackling our everyday life uh, on a local level but also on a global level. So. Um, we kind of reorganize the whole ecosystem and we're still working on the reshaping of the scientific ecosystem and innovative ecosystem in Serbia. So we have a two now big funds, uh, national funds that are uh, directly financing on one side science, like a science fund, uh, but also uh, innovation and collaboration between academia and uh, industry and private sector, uh, it's innovation fund. We are also part of the European Union framework uh, Horizon Europe uh, and the government is also investing uh, substantial funds to support this uh, collaboration, I would say international collaboration. And uh, now we have uh, national projects, so we based uh, our future plans on uh, previous success uh, within the ICT uh, field where this uh, area became uh, the second uh, most important export good from Serbia at the rate uh, at the level of 2.7 billion euros on annual uh, basis with a growth annual growth of around 40 percent. I'm interested to pick up on what you said about the second highest point the first being perhaps 20 years ago because it's easy to forget that Serbia 20 years ago, or a little more than 20 years ago, was emerging from years of war, of sanctions, a pariah status, certainly in the eyes of much of the West. And yet here you are. It's an extraordinary leap from having rejoined the international community to forging a path at the forefront of technological development. Yes, I completely agree, but I think uh, the science uh, is something that doesn't recognize barriers, uh, that requires international collaboration and communication with everyone. So, you know, the, the, the knowledge has to flow like a water. 
Uh, and I see the science as a really new face of Serbia, uh, innovations, and we are really now trying to build up the system that we become a visible spot on a kind of global map of innovations, of science, of knowledge, and really to attract people from all around the world with big infrastructural investments, but also investments in education and investments in people, because you know the people are the main main spice in this. Well, just to stay on this point, tell me about some of the challenges involved over the last two decades in shaking off the image of the past, in rebuilding an economy from the ground up. And importantly, also forging new alliances. Yes, well, I find the challenges challenging. I mean, they, they force you to, to find new solutions, to, to rethink and, uh, you know, to, to make a new, new way forward. So, uh, yes, we were facing challenges like a brain drain. Uh, but with uh, strategical investments, and uh, strategical goals, uh, you can turn around this, uh, this uh, even problem. Particularly in ICT, we are now having brain gain. Really, we are in a plus uh, if we talk about uh, experts in this area. We have around 120,000 people working in this, uh, in this field with 40,000 developers, and this number is uh, growing. So. Uh, when you have a good infrastructure, good R&D, uh, when you uh, attracted big companies that are opening and creating new jobs and the vibrant uh, ecosystem, startup ecosystem, people will stay, people will come back and people will come from all around the world. You, you may well prefer the idea of looking forward. Absolutely. Than looking back, uh, and, well, and I, would, I would back, understand that. It's but always, you know, you are learning your lessons. But it's but very, it's forward. very interesting for us to understand how it is that you get to a place where you have all of these things that you describe: this infrastructure, these ecosystems. When you start from ground zero, twenty-three years ago, coming out of a socialist republic coming out of international sanctions, coming out of pariah status. This didn't just happen. Oh no, it didn't happen. I mean, uh, you need strong economy. You have to build first, you know, the economy, the infrastructure. You need to build the, the country which is recognized, okay, this is a good place for investments. That means you have to intervene on a legal framework different incentives for R&D centers, different incentives for uh, direct foreign investments. So it takes time, it takes a lot of effort and very focused uh, strategical thinking of the government. And after 10 years, you get the ecosystem where you can implement you know, the next level. The next level that you attract uh, more sophisticated companies, uh, like Continental, Schneider Electric, Microsoft to open their R&D centers. Now we are attracting biopharma companies to come and to see and recognize Serbia as a potential innovation hub in a broader region. And this is also bringing the whole region, you know, together under these uh, hubs. So I see Serbia as a, you know, leader in in this way, in this uh, in this manner. I, I want to talk. Now about you, Jelena Begovic, let's try to get a little bit under your skin because you have an interesting background, of course. You grew up in a socialist republic, Serbia, part of the former Yugoslavia, educated there. You became a decorated scientist yourself, a molecular uh, biologist, just as Serbia was emerging from the turbulent Milosevic years. How likely a path was it for a woman to follow into the world of science at that time? Well, actually, um, in our country, and I would say thanks to the socialist system, uh, the women were included in all areas of, of, of the society equally as men. So 
for us, you know, it's nothing special. It was normal to get educated. It was normal to build uh, a build career. Uh, you choose what you want to be in your life, and you can reach really the highest levels in in uh, in hierarchy. And the, the numbers in our country, more than 50% of students are female. More than almost 60% of the PhDs are females. Um, at the research institute, 60% are females. Uh, with, uh, for instance, at the University of Belgrade, out of 11 institutes, nine are led by women. Now we have a minister of science as a woman. So I cannot say that I uh, found the, the path too difficult. Maybe it's my nature. Uh, I don't give up on things. Uh, I do have ambitions and visions how we, we, we should uh, go further with, with science and innovation. But nevertheless, the cultural surrounding was very supportive. So the system was very supportive for uh, women, you know, to build their careers. Okay, so here you are two decades down the line, uh, Serbia initiating a resolution, your ministry no doubt leading the way, a resolution that the United Nations adopted this year, a couple of months ago, titled the International Decade of Sciences for Sustainable Development that will run from next year 2024 to 2033. What are the mechanics of that? Well, actually, I'm so proud of this, uh, this uh, resolution and uh, th this has been a I would say good, great uh, diplomatic success, but also success of science. I see it really as a success of science, uh, where we initiated this resolution and it was adopted at the end of the August this uh, year. So um, when we look at the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and how are we reaching them, the numbers are not really good. About 15% of the goals targets, uh, 140 targets, we reach to the level that is sufficient for the moment. Uh, unfortunately, the things were slowing down due to corona, geopolitical events and everything. So until 2030, we're not going to reach most of them, unfortunately. And the idea came to somehow involve science to use more scientific evidence-based data, more organized on a global level and to try to speed up the, uh, the reaching of uh, SDGs because they are more or less related to science from the climate change to life on earth, beneath earth, uh, uh, zero hunger, everything is directly or indirectly uh, connected to science. And this is the idea to involve much more entities in every government than on um, intergovernmental levels, on a global level, to try to push forward the sustainable development goals. Because I think that this is our, it might be our last chance, you know, to speed up this process. You find yourself, not entirely intentionally as far as I can tell, in politics, in a ministerial seat, and now you have to navigate not just science, but the political direction of the country uh, as well. I wonder to what extent do science and politics interact? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, from my point of view now they're interacting, uh, but science is becoming very, very important for the development of the society, for the development of economy, thus, you know, it has to be interaction, of course, with, with the politics. And uh, I think uh, we should use the power of science for the development uh, of a society as a whole from different aspects. And that requires the support from the government. Uh, so uh, it's the fact. I mean, if uh, we want to build a Bio4 campus, uh, project of around 400 million euros, you need a huge support from the government, not only financial support, but overall support in order really to, you know, get there in 2026 where, where, where your plan is. Uh, the support for science, for changes, for changes of legal framework, you again need the support 
uh, of, of politics of the government. So I think there is not a single part of our life that is not directly or indirectly connected and depending somehow on the gover government and on the, on the politics and I'm saying about you know, the global, global level. But I'm happy that science is becoming important. Let me put a more specific okay. slant on that yeah. question, because Serbia straddles a number of quite sensitive geopolitical fault lines. On the one hand, you're sponsoring a successful global resolution of the United Nations. On the other hand, maintaining friendly relations with Russia, for instance. On the one hand, you have a foot in the European Union. On the other hand, or foot rather, a foot in the Chinese camp, a big supporter and very involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. How sensitive is that balance to maintain? Well, actually, for me, it comes naturally. I mean, I'm a scientist. So as I said previously, for me, the borders don't exist. So everywhere where is a good science, where is a chance to collaborate, where is a chance to grow together, uh, I will choose that. From, from the perspective of a ministry or minister of science uh, because uh, I think to, to fight the global challenges we need to really think globally and that means no borders and uh, as you can see there are no borders. I mean the technology is developing, the science is uh, uh, developing, uh, we are reaching milestones every six months because everyone is working together. So I see a science as a, as, a, as a very strong power to overcome different challenges that are not directly related to science. But science is somehow, you know, finding its way in, 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 in uh, every, every single field and every single challenge that we're facing. Well, ultimately, of course, Serbia is a leader clearly in its region, in the Western Balkan region. It's a country trying to rebuild its economy out of a difficult past, trying to punch above its weight politically and scientifically. And hence, big relationships with countries like China. $510 million in bilateral contracts signed this year uh, alone at a Belgrade business forum. Yet, as I mentioned, on your doorstep is the European Union much of which sees China not just as a direct competitor but in many ways as a threat and particularly in your field science that you say is borderless. They might argue with that in terms of some of the technology that China is involved in. Don't you at some point down this road have to choose one side or the other because aren't you at some point down this road going to alienate one side? Well, actually, other. when it comes to science, I wouldn't like to choose. And it's very difficult to speak, you know, about a future because I really don't know what the future is, is uh, uh, bringing. But I'm still not, you know, ready to give up on amazing technologies that are coming from different parts of the world, amazing uh, brains that you can discuss science uh, from all around the, the world. And... Uh, and the fast development of some, some, some countries, you know, uh, it's important to be part of that. So uh, collaboration, 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 th this, is, uh, this is my motto, as far as I can, I can go. Well, just to dig a little deeper into that idea, mm -hmm. because you mentioned earlier the brain drain, and that occurred to me as well as an issue that you are trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. Something like 10% of your workforce has left the country in recent years. Much higher numbers in the rest of the Western Balkans, but we're talking here about skilled, energetic, educated, tech-savvy, largely young people, many of them heading west into countries in the European Union for not just the services sector that they find appealing there, but for the values that they find appealing there. In trying to entice them back, is there not a political aspect to that in the sense that you've got to be encouraging them back into a country with values and an infrastructure and an ecosystem that they agree with rather than necessarily one that is propped up by, say, Chinese investment? Is there a contradiction there? 
I don't think so. I mean, the first of all, the, the, the numbers uh, are much better compared to 10 years ago. Uh, for instance, uh, Germany is uh, around one third of our population that leaves Serbia goes to Germany. And according to their very precise uh, data, most of those uh, uh, citizens have uh, high school or elementary school. So not any more highly educated people are leaving Serbia, which is an excellent sign for us. That means that we are doing a good job. Uh, if we're trying, you know, if we're managing to keep the people in ICT industry and attract them, we're doing a good job. Well, now we're doing this in life sciences, particularly in, in uh, biotech, uh, but it's very important to build the infrastructure and to give them more or less similar conditions as they can get somewhere abroad. It doesn't matter where, but somewhere outside, outside their country. Uh, but the brain drain, I mean, to go somewhere where it's more ambitious, it's a normal thing. It happens. I mean, I've been discussing with my colleagues from Britain. They are now, you know, feeling brain drain towards United States. From United States, uh, companies, startups are going to China. So, uh, I mean, it's very difficult, you know, to stop these uh, processes. Uh, a global melting pot. Glo yes. And you're absolutely. now very much in it. Absolutely. Well. Moving on on that point, at the International Biotech Future Forum held in Belgrade uh, this autumn, you spoke of convening all these sort of global super brains, policymakers and investors in order, in your words, to consider what kind of a future lies in store for humanity with the development of new technologies. I presume you're talking about things like artificial intelligence that could go either way, good or bad. What's your vision yes. of that? Well, well the, the problem with the high speed development of technology, technologies, is always, you know, the legal framework, the ethics are lagging behind. And it's very difficult really, really to, to keep up uh, with what's going on, particularly biotech, artificial intelligence, now quantum computing, because nobody can tell you where we are really going uh, with a certainty, significant certainty. So we have to be cautious on one side not to stop the development of technology because it's going to develop anyway. Maybe it's not going to develop here, but it's going to develop there. Uh, but we have to involve more experts from a legal point of view and ethical point of view and to combine them with those experts from AI or biotech to, to at least follow what is happening and to make the, the possibility of interventions uh, somehow not to end up on a bad scenario. This is another crucial place, isn't it, where politics and science intersect and where you have both hats on. Yes, I, I, I can, I can agree with that. The scientist in you wants to let it go and see where it goes. Yes. The politician in you needs to be mindful. Absolutely. Of protecting society. Absolutely, absolutely. And communication with the, with the society is also very important because people, uh, due to this very fast development of technology, are getting confused. And then from the confusion, they go to fear. And then, you know, you end up uh, with a loop that people are rejecting amazing tools and assistance that is ahead of us. But we have to educate. We have to educate kids how to use those technologies. We have to educate citizens what are the benefits of the technologies and also what are the potential dangers of the technology in order to avoid it. And of course, ultimately, looking into this murky and yet also exciting future, Serbia, you're happy to say, is pivotal in, in driving the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I feel it, you know, in my gut and I see the results. It's not just the feeling. I see the results. Uh, the government has decided, you know, to give us a ministry for science, technological development, innovation, full support, you know, to, to, go, uh, to go full speed ahead. Jelena Begovic, Serbia's Minister of Science, Technological Development and Innovation. Thank you so much for talking to us. It was my pleasure.